Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank LabRoots for inviting me to speak. Because of this virtual format, I've been asked to introduce myself. I am a PharmD grad from UCSF and completed my residency with Kaiser in LA. While at UCI for 13 years as a pharmacist specialist in the Department of Peds Division of Child Development, I became an expert in compounding running double-blind placebo-controlled medication assessments for the Child Development Center and using that skill for preclinical and clinical trials used for the development of several drugs, including Concerta with the Alzacorp. I ultimately obtained two patents in neuropathic pain and one in the buccal delivery of cannabis. As a diplomat and fellow of the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, I have incorporated cannabis into my functional medicine practice. I need to disclose that my primary employment today is in the cannabis space, both as a clinician, researcher, manufacturer, and educator. At the conclusion of this program, uh, you should be able to list the most common medical indications that cannabis is used for today discuss the importance of knowing why the formulation and route of administration impacts the onset and duration of action of phytocannabinoid therapy, and discuss the value of cannabis as an alternative or adjunct treatment in chronic pain conditions with or without opiates. So I'm going to go over some basic uh, cannabis terminology discuss general considerations when recommending a cannabis product or treatment, list the most common real world medicinal uses of cannabis today and share peer reviewed data to support the indications discussed and also present some case studies regarding those indications. Which picture on the left or right depicts the cola of hemp? To even the trained eye, they are indistinguishable today. On the right is hemp, and on the left is Santa Cruz Tsunami, which is a four to one CBD to THC uh, uh, cultivar. Both plants are Cannabis sativa L, which describes the species. Marijuana and hemp are regulatory terms used to describe THC content, marijuana having greater than 0.3 milligrams per gram of THC in the dry weight of the plant and realize it is still in the US a schedule one drug and by definition has no recognized medicinal value and is highly addictive. Hemp having 0.3 milligrams per gram or less of THC in the dry weight of the plant. In con uh, Congress in October of 2018, defined hemp as an agricultural commodity um, with all of its constituents, legal in states that have an approved USDA program and by default federally legal. Bacteria and fungi have strains, plants do not. Strain is the layperson's term for cultivar, describing phenotypically different plants. Common terms are sativa, indica, and hybrid. Hybrid is a mix of the two and makes up greater than 95% of the flower market today. Varietal names include Jack Herrera, Blueberry, and Canatonic respectively. Chemovar is determined by terpene profile, cannabinoids, potency, and quantity of standard biomolecules that make up the plant. At some point, we hope to utilize chemovar as a method to ensure more reproducible cannabis experiences and effects. Now, most clinical studies of cannabis today focus on the contents of two phytocannabinoids, THC and CBD, regardless of the fact that there have been identified 144 phytocannabinoids 
and now over 500 physiologically active substances in cannabis. In this heat map, the LCMS concentration of 36 cannabis cultivars up on the X axis are presented from work out of David Meary's lab in Israel. In typical lab testing in the US, we only look at nine to 13 cannabinoids. As you can see, there's 10 different THC and 10 different CBD types alone, which speak to the difficulty a patient or clinician has in determining what mix of cannabinoids are helping or hindering treatment outcomes. Now, without getting into the weeds of detail, there are three general terms for extracts. Full spectrum, which attempts to maintain the full profile of the cannabis plant that was processed. Broad spectrum, containing non-measurable THC and attempt to maintain the remainder of the full plant profile. And isolates, which contain generally greater than 99% of a single cannabinoid. The method of extraction will determine what components of the plant are able to be removed, and that content varies significantly based on that method. Uh, CO2 uses either supercritical or subcritical extraction. There's light hydrocarbon extraction, alcohol, petroleum hydrocarbons, and many others, uh, some of them artisanal, uh, including water, steam distillation, uh, oil extraction, uh, like olive oil or butter or cold press extraction. Challenges facing a practitioner with recommending a route of administration is that the products in that category can be very different in formulation and content. In the formulation, you can have excipients and surfactants or diluents, the content of actives, the extraction method used, the forms of the APIs, whether there is chemical or mechanical modification of the cannabinoids, the bioavailability is modified, uh, especially with the route of administration. The onset and duration of action, because the pharmacokinetics of cannabinoids are nonlinear and biphasic, as well as dose dependent. The genomics of the individual, as well as the sex, can have significant impact. General principles on route of administration and ratios of the major APIs uh, will discuss, uh, but it is important not to categorize clinical outcomes based on the route of administration or the product form. For an example, this is a patient that was seen in a San Diego dispensary uh, mid-30s, treatment-resistant epilepsy on four different medications and still having about eight seizures per day. The family uh, was guided to try a three-to-one ratio of a sublingual um, oil-based solution, 40 milligrams per mil. There wasn't any significant terpenes in the product. And what was remarkable is within 24 hours, this patient became seizure free for the first time in his life. And he stayed seizure free through the remaining uh, product until they ran out, went back to the dispensary and asked for a three to one sublingual solution and MCT oil, 40 milligrams per mil and the seizures came back within 24 hours. They went back to the dispensary, discussed uh, you know, their experience, 
and one of the staff was actually the individual that did the extraction and knew that they used two different cultivars. So we went back, got more of the Diamond OG, made the extraction, and again, the patient uh, became seizure free. So if we look at the typical uh, certificate of analysis of the cannabinoids, there were nine that were identified on the C of A. And if you look at the label on most products, it will have CBD, THC, maybe CBN, and maybe THCA. And if you look at those numbers, they look almost identical. Down on the far right, some minor cannabinoids, CBGA and CBC, that was the most striking difference in the C of A. Uh, and although we can't claim causation, uh, clearly um, this is a perfect example of why you can't look at one product and assume they're all the same. These are some of the common routes of administration used. They include inhalation, whether combustion or vaporization. There's even MDIs out now. Uh, orally administered, which includes edible forms that I like to consider as food, candy, and drinks. And then the typical pharmaceutical routes of administration orally. Sublingual and buccal depends on placement in the mouth and it includes all kinds of different uh, formulations. Topical includes transdermal, as well as every imaginable cream, roll-on, lotion, balm. Um, they're all out there, as well as suppositories. Now, there are general principles we can apply to routes of administration and ratios of the major cannabinoids and terpenes that help with initial guidance on choosing a route or product. The bioavailability and duration of action are substantially impacted by choice of route and formulation. Inhalation generally has an onset of less than a minute and a duration of one to three hours. Edibles typically are uh, an onset of action of about 45 minutes to two hours, but can extend to four hours um, as far as an onset and have a duration of action, which is dose dependent, of six hours to over 24 hours. What's in the stomach will have an impact on the onset of action. Typically, edibles have an unpredictable onset and duration for most people. Sublingual, meaning under the tongue, uh, there's tinctures and fatty acid solutions like olive oil, coconut oil, MCT, and so forth, typically have a 15 to 45 minute onset of action, but is variable based on how long the solution is held in the mouth before swallowing, as well as the solvent, ethanol being a much better uh, solvent than uh, fatty acids. Which brings up, you know, as a pharmacist, misbranding. Uh, unfortunately, our regulators went to the High Times Pharmacopeia for guidance on dosage forms instead of the USP. Formulations make a difference in onset and duration. Buccal absorption between cheek or lip and gum is uh, again placement. There's different formulations, trochees, films, ODTs. Uh, I like this route of, administ of administration the best because it generates the least amount of saliva depending on placement in the mouth under your upper lip is the best spot to um, allow something to dissolve. 
and uh, create the least amount of saliva. Onset of action can be as short as three minutes to 15 minutes and is variable based on the formulation and duration is typically four to eight hours. Now, how could one adaptogenic herb have an effect on so many conditions? This is only a partial list of the conditions patients use cannabis for. I've highlighted and starred conditions that we see most frequently in our clinic, and it includes chronic pain, anxiety, insomnia, and uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea uh, and vomiting, uh, and then the chronic, uh, in, you know, pain conditions like fibromyalgia, um, autoimmune disorders. We see uh, considerable numbers of those, and uh, we see uh, great responses in using cannabis. Now, to look at the myriad of the endocannabinoid system receptors involved in pain, and this is published from 2019, and we've already found more receptors. Now, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine published a report back in 1996 on the medical evidence of cannabis following California voter approval of Prop 215, allowing the, med the medical use of cannabis first in uh, any of the states. In January of 2017, 18 years after their first report, they did an extensive review of the literature focused exclusively on human literature and did not consider basic research conducted using animal models. The committee reached nearly 100 conclusions uh, from reviewing uh, more than 10,000 research articles and they broke it down into levels of evidence, uh, the most substantial being conclusive evidence of clinical efficacy. This is in January of 2017, guys. And what does it list? Chronic pain in adults. Conclusive evidence, 2017, from a non-political entity revered for their, uh, for their skill set in evaluating data, as well as chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, and uh, use of multiple sclerosis uh, with spasticity. This was 2017, and cannabis is still a Schedule I drug in the U.S. Now, chronic pain comes with many disease states, and chronic wounds are a source of debilitating pain. The World Health Organization identified chronic wounds as a major global public health crisis. It affects up to 6% of the population. Females have twice the prevalence as males, and the U.S. spends up to $80 billion annually. It's associated with the opioid crisis and proliferation of antibiotic superbugs. Chronic wounds have poor healing rates, high reoccurrence rates, rising amputation rates, high levels of suffering, the costs we discussed, and wound-related pain continues to be poorly managed. Pain in itself inhibits healing. So do opioids, the mainstay for treating wound-related pain, and nonsteroidals. You can see the list of side effects here uh, from nonsteroidals, tricyclic antidepressants, SSRIs, uh, Tylenol, and so forth. Current treatment guidelines do not address breakthrough pain. <clears throat> 
Epidermolysis bullosa is a rare blistering skin disorder that is challenging to manage because of skin fragility and repeated wound healing causing itching, pain, limited mobility, and recurrent infections. In this case study of three, which used topical CBD oil, self-initiated and self-titrated, all case reports, uh, all cases reported uh, analgesia, reduced blistering, improved wound healing, and one case was able to be weaned off of opioids. Two. Preclinical work shows cannabis extracts promote wound closure and analgesia. NUC, or non-uremic calciflaxis leg ulcers, carry a 45 to 80% one-year mortality rate. They're difficult to treat, they're costly, the response to treatment is poor, and it's painful. In the study of two subjects using two different topical formulations of phytocannabinoids, it demonstrated a complete closure of an NUC in uh, a mean of 76.3 days, and wound-related pain was significantly uh, changed within 0.6 months, and they were able to DC analgesics at 2.1 months. This is an example of one of the subjects. On the left, what the uh, ulcers look like, um, and on the right, full uh, resolution of the lesions. Now, JG, in this case study, it's a 52-year-old white male, a cannabis expert and activist. He tripped <clears throat> walking in his uh, nursery early one morning and planted his face on a concrete stair. He decided to treat himself, no MD, no stitches, and it probably has to do with his father being a professor of podiatric medicine. He used his topical 1% CBD THC uh, topical spray. It was an ethanol extraction and a 1% CBD spray, which was uh, from an isolate. The ingredients, uh, other ingredients listed in his spray um, are therapeutic, by the way. He applied each solution four times a day, cleaning with uh, hydrogen peroxide twice a day. So this is what it looked like following his, <laughs> his uh, dressing of the wound. About 36 hours later, day seven and day nine. Let's look at pain in older adults. Up to 50% of community dwelling and 80% of nursing home residents have pain. Pain affects 80% of patients greater than or equal to 85 years old. There's many common causes of pain. Uh, they include chronic disease states, post hepatic neuralgia, spinal stenosis, nocturnal leg pain, etc. Pain leads to decreased functional status, increased falls, depression, interrupted sleep, anxiety, agitation, and a poor quality of life. The adverse events associated with typical pain treatment in the elderly include falls and fractures, delirium, constipation, drug-drug interactions, dizziness, hypotension, a decreased quality of life, and uh, the CDC actually reported greater than 67,000 fatalities uh, related to opiate um, overdose. 
In this Israeli study, a prospective uh, study of 2,736 patients, 65 years old or uh, greater using cannabis uh, between 2015 and 2017, the most common indications, pain and cancer. After six months of inhaled cannabis use, 93.7% reported improvement in their condition. A pain level dropped from a median of eight to a median of four, which is consistent with other reported uh, studies in the literature. The number of reported falls was significantly reduced. Most common adverse events, dizziness and dry mouth, and after six months of cannabis use, 18.1% decreased or stopped opiate usage. In this case study of RC, a 76-year-old white female, a retired pharmacist, she has a significant past medical history for fibromyalgia syndrome and osteoarthritis diagnosed in 1985, uh, hypothyroid, achalasia, Lyme and facet degeneration. Her chief complaints when we saw her at the clinic were insomnia, a 9.5 out of 10, chronic pain status post uh, fall uh, that injured her uh, back, neck, and shoulders. Meds that she tried included just about everything. Her current treatment, low dose. Uh, naloxone, three milligrams QHS, herbs and nutraceuticals, physical therapy two times a week, and cannabis therapy. We started her with a CBD buccal trochee, 12 and a half milligrams, uh, three times a day. It dropped her pain from a seven out of 10 to a four out of 10. We added a CBD capsule, broad spectrum, twice a day and added a acid and neutral form of THC in a six to four ratio, 10 milligram cap at HS. It dropped her 9.5 out of 10 insomnia to a three out of 10. We continue to adjust her cannabis treatment to the current therapy she's on today, which is 50 milligrams twice a day, uh, she has a pain level at three out of 10 and her insomnia using a 30 milligram dose of the six to four acid to neutral form of THC uh, has her down at a zero to one out of 10. BJ is a 73 year old white male, overweight retired judge and the father of a close friend of mine. Uh, he has a significant past medical history as being a jock in high school, uh, wearing his body out, working on the loading docks during college, and having a diagnosis of osteoarthritis in 1991 in toes, ankles, and hips. He's six foot today, 225 pounds, uh, but he's been as high as 255 pounds. Six and a half years ago, he twisted his left knee with an eight to nine out of 10 pain uh, and has no other uh, medical uh, problems. He has pain in his joints and he could not with traditional therapy get below a six out of 10 on the meds tried. He has a six to seven out of 10 uh, rating of insomnia. He tried non-steroidals at the max dose until renal function started to decline. He switched to Tylenol, which uh, he continued to use until he got abnormal uh, liver function tests. He can't stand opiates. And so uh, this was a challenge for me. And so I started him on uh, a therapeutic dose of molecularly distilled fish oil. And remember that 2000 milligrams or more per day of EPA is a great COX-2 inhibitor. 
and we ultimately got him to try cannabis once I got his pain down to a three out of 10. So we started with CBD, 10 milligram trochee buccally, three to four times a day, it brought it down another point, two out of 10, but he didn't like the taste or the route of administration, so he went to an oral capsule, starting with 25 milligrams in the morning and going to 50 milligrams uh, in the morning. He likes the taste of a sublingual uh, oil-based uh, cannabis solution, 50 milligrams per mil. He uses between 100 and 150 milligrams in divided doses, depending on how much activity and pain he has during the day. And uh, we finally got him on a CBD THC 18 to 2 ratio, 20 milligram cap, of which uh, now his pain is a 0 to 1 out of 10. And he claims he sleeps like a baby again. Now, neuropathic pain uh, in this meta analysis by Mookie um, reviewed 16 studies a total of 1,750 participants. It used, it looked at nabiximols, which is GW uh, Pharma's uh, uh, Sativex product, uh, nabilone, uh, trinabinol, uh, two FDA approved cannabinoids, uh, placebo uh, controlled studies, uh, they even looked at a dihydrocodine opiate study. And what his uh, meta-analysis concluded was that cannabis-based medicines may increase the number of people achieving 50% or greater pain relief. And the cannabis-based medicine has probably increased the number of people achieving pain relief of 30% or greater both compared to placebo. Most of the literature regarding fibromyalgia syndrome is survey-based. And this observational retrospective study of 56, um, looking at cannabis users and non-users with moderate to severe symptoms of fibromyalgia that were resistant to pharmacological treatment mean age of 50 and cohorts were matched. They utilized smoke or oral uh, administration of, of cannabinoids. The VAS or visual analog scale was used for perceived benefits as well as uh, three different surveys. In the results, there were significant improvements of the symptoms of fibromyalgia in patients using cannabis in the study, although there was a variability in patterns, it did demonstrate uh, that there is a tie between the endocannabinoid system and the stress response system in fibromyalgia. And cannabinoid treatment demonstrates a benefit on the symptomatology. Using a five-point Likert scale, black being strong, gray uh, being mild, and white being no change, there were significant improvements in pain, sleep, stiffness, mood, and anxiety. Minimal uh, uh, improvement in tiredness, um, but that was associated with uh, untreated adrenal fatigue. There was moderate improvement in headaches. Looking at the perceived effects of cannabis, the gray bar being pre-treatment and the black bar being two hours post-treatment, again, shows improvement in pain, stiffness, relaxation. Somnolence was actually a positive measure in the study as, as well as uh, well-being. In this follow-up study to Habib et al.'s uh, 2018 publication, studying the characteristics of cannabis use in fibromyalgia patients in Israel, it looked at uh, 
121, mean age of 45, 73% female, um, identified the amount of cannabis uh, used per month, uh, as well as the uh, cultivars that were most liked. They showed a mean improvement in sleep and pain that was slightly more than 77%. 47% of the participants stopped any other treatment for fibromyalgia. That's pretty remarkable. October 2020, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial was uh, conducted to determine the benefit of a THC-rich full-spectrum oil on the symptoms and quality of life in 17 fibromyalgia patients. This was an eight-week study. The FIQ uh, was used on each visit, which, were, uh, which was at every 10 days. So they started uh, day one with an FIQ, and the dose of the product that they were using, which was an olive oil extraction, of a cultivar having 24.44 milligrams of THC and 0.51 milligrams of CBD. They used one drop and that was the treatment every day and on day uh, each 10 day uh, reevaluation, they were able to increase that dose by one drop if it was warranted. In the results, the mean uh, average dose was 3.6 drops per day. The FIQ uh, baseline was similar with each cohort. The placebo versus cannabis treatment was significantly uh, uh, different, and the cannabis cohort pre and post treatment was also uh, significantly. Uh, improved. So their conclusions of this study uh, that was done in Brazil, uh, low cost, well tolerated treatment generated a better quality of life and reduced symptoms. In this case study, AG, a 28 year old white female with daily migraines, worse around menstrual cycle, has had them for three years and daily over the last seven months. Prior doctors prescribed pain medication and preventatives that cause bad side effects and minimal relief. She began taking a 12.5 milligram CBD uh, trochee three times a day and adding a acid and neutral form of THC in a six to four ratio, 10 milligram cap at bedtime to help with sleep. By day two, AG experienced reduced migraines. Uh, her numeric analog score went from a seven to eight out of 10 down to four out of 10. By the end of the month, she was having days with no migraines and now takes CBD as needed when she has break, a breakthrough migraine. In this uh, published study from our clinic, an observational longitudinal study over 12 weeks looking at a primary diagnosis of chronic non-cancer pain using the buccal route of administration of a trochee, uh, the onset of analgesia was between 5 and 40 minutes. The average reduction in a pain intensity numeric rating scale was 4.9 again, similar to published literature. And of the 31 subjects that were using opiates, 26 or 84% reduced or discontinued use with no reported uh, symptoms of withdrawal. And 100% reported uh, feeling an improvement in a global rating scale. In this study, uh, Blake et al. used a cannabis-based uh, medicine, Sativex, 
which is approximately a one-to-one -one ratio CBD to THC uh, with placebo in a randomized double-blind parallel group study in 58 patients over five weeks of treatment. The cannabis-based medicine was administered by uh, oral mucosal spray in the evening and assessments were made the following morning. Efficacy outcomes assessed were pain on movement, pain at rest, morning stiffness, and sleep quality measured by a numeric analog scale, uh, as well as using the short form McGill pain questionnaire and the DAS uh, 28 for a measure of disease activity. There were statistically significant improvements in pain on movement, pain at rest, and sleep. There was no effect on morning stiffness, but the baseline scores were low. Uh, adverse events were mild or moderate, and no patients withdrew. In the retrospective review of low back pain patients on opiates at a colleague's of mine's clinic up in Northern California, he did a chart review on October of 2018 and uh, looked at his patient base with that diagnosis. The median years on opioids were three. The morphine milligram equivalent was 21 milligrams per day as an average, but the range was huge. Chronic users made up 30 and intermediate users 31. This, uh, he identified the uh, median cannabis uh, uh, consumption per day as well as the route of administration and forms. In his results, he showed 50.8%, which uh, N of 30, stopped opioids. The mean length of time was 6.4 years with uh, pretty substantial range there. Uh, there was 29 that nine reduced their dose, kept the dose the same, or 17 actually increased. Uh, their opiate consumption. No variables collected predicted who stopped opiates, but the higher cannabis usage had a greater success at stopping opiate consumption. In the International Association for Cannabinoid Medicines Bulletin, January 31st of this year, released details of Ming et al.'s observational uh, study of patients remaining on cannabis for six months through 12 months. Patient reported outcomes in those consuming medicinal cannabis. The proportion of cannabis users who reported opioids decreased by half from 40.8 at baseline to 23.9 at 12 months. Pain intensity, pain-related interference scores were reduced, quality of life, and general health symptom scores were improved. There were 2,970 cancer patients treated in Israel between 2015 in 2017. Of those patients, 1,144 were surveyed about pain. Prior to cannabis treatment, 53% had a pain score of 8 out of 10. At six months, only 4.6% had a pain score of 8 out of 10. And this is in a patient population that is typically getting worse. Of 1,165 patients surveyed about quality of life prior to cannabis treatment, 19% reported a good quality of life. And at six months, 69.5% reported a good quality.
quality of life. 33.9% on opioids prior to cannabis treatment, and at six months, 36% discontinued their, uh, their opiate use. In this case study, MEV is a 60-year-old white female that works for the Nevada Farm Bureau and is an avid horseback rider as well as a sunbather. She has a significant past medical history of hypertension in 2010 and in 2016, uh, she had uh, the removal of a BRAF positive cutaneous melanoma with clear margins. And typically there's about a 98% five-year survival rate uh, when caught with clear margins. On 8 uh, August of 2020, she got pancreatitis, and in December of last year, uh, she had a return of her BRAF-positive metastatic cutaneous melanoma. Um, she has a significant family history of a younger brother dying from melanoma, but uh, there were no details of uh, that. And her chief complaints coming to me uh, was chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, a 9 out of 10. Uh, she had no appetite at all. Uh, she was in uh, excruciating pain and had limited mobility. She wasn't able to walk to her car uh, without an, uh, aid, and she had um, exhaustion. This is MEV, and that is her melanoma. So she's been on the Ritavi mectovi protocol, um, hypertension treatment, opiates for pain, and antiemetic therapy. Uh, when we saw her, uh, and started cannabis therapy on her. She was still on the chemotherapy protocol on one antihypertensive and on uh, oxycodone 10 milligrams in the morning and in the evening. We started her on a one to five ratio of CBD to THC in a sublingual oil. She was taking one half to one dropper full at bedtime only. And within 12 hours, the family noticed a significant difference. She was able to start eating again and move better. On the 16th, just three days later, she was able to DC her opiate and was only on cannabis and chemo and was able to walk to her car. 106 patients on continuous cannabis therapy that survived two interviews six to eight weeks apart using the common terminology criteria for adverse events showed a significant improvement in their cancer or cancer treatment-related symptoms. She, they had pain med reduction of 43%. Severe pain drop of 26%, 33% had a reduction in the use of antidepressants and or anxiolytics. This is a great free reference. The URL is uh, listed and I advise anyone that uh, is looking at cancer treatment uh, using cannabinoids uh, to to take a look at this reference. Now, this was a poster presented in September of 19 at the CanMed um, uh, program in, in Pasadena. And uh, it was created by Kristen Wolschlager and Elizabeth Sherwood. Both of these uh, gals are nurses and part of the Oncology Nurses Society and American Cannabis Nurses Association. I know you can't see much of this, but um, when you get the slide, you can uh, you know, take a look at the detail that is here. This is tremendous 
uh, work done uh, mostly by Kristen, and uh, she's one of the leaders uh, in examining cannabis treatment for breast cancer. It's a fabulous reference. Now, MP, in this case study, a 68-year-old white male diagnosed two years prior with prostate cancer, grade 1, G3, uh, and had a high level of anxiety and was looking for CBD to deal with the anxiety. His previous uh, treatment, uh, he refused radiation. They tried uh, freezing the cancer, which resulted in a treatment failure. And so he was really uh, done with any therapy. Uh, he didn't do any lifestyle changes at all. And he does have a significant uh, family history of cancer. He began taking a 12.5 milligram CBD trochee three times a day after seven days with minimal anxiety relief. He increased it up to 50 milligrams per 24 hours. What was remarkable is that his blood work continued to show a declining PSA. And by the time uh, that it dropped to 0.9, the doctor did a biopsy, blood work, and CT scan, which confirmed complete remission with no detectable prostate cancer. This is a URL to take you to 420 Television to uh, watch an interview from one of our clinic's patients that came to us uh, with stage four metastatic ovarian cancer. Um, and we started her on a cannabis program uh, after her doctor uh, told her to go home and die. Projectcbd.org, a fabulous reference. I uh, encourage everyone, uh, whether you're a healthcare provider or not, to review it, um, I strongly recommend that you visit this site and learn the science as well as the real life issues involved with cannabis therapeutics. These are some professional organizations uh, as well as uh, information uh, sites that you can take a look at. And I would like to thank you, along with a good colleague of mine. We're standing in West Virginia in a hemp field. 